So this is one of the basic messages of the book of Revelation. Behold, I am coming soon. And that's a reference to the final coming, the second advent of Jesus at the end of time. Second, notice that the parousia, you can tell this is the parousia that he's speaking about, and not just his coming within time, his presence with us, because he ties it to the final judgment. He says, I'm coming soon to bring my recompense and to repay each person according to what he has done. So this is a reference to the final judgment. Now, notice here, this is really important for Catholics to, to, to highlight, is that over and over again in the New Testament, Although, of course, we are saved by grace. Salvation is a gift of God's grace. Uh, the New Testament is equally clear that we will be judged at the final judgment by works, right? So you see this not just in the letter of St. Paul, who will talk about judgment according to works, for example, in Romans chapter 2, but here in the Apocalypse of John as well, where Jesus himself says, I'm coming soon to repay each one for how he has believed? No, that's not what he says, although obviously faith is important, don't get me wrong. But he says, I'm going to repay according to what each person has done. So this is where we get the doctrine or the teaching of judgment by works, final judgment according to actions. So it's always a both and for us as Catholics. Both faith and works are crucial in the process and in the path of salvation. A third aspect of this text that's really crucial, and for me at least the central one I wanted to emphasize here, is its revelation of the divinity of Christ. This is something that people continue to debate. There are obviously a lot of the heresies in the early church revolved around the question of Christ's humanity and divinity, the fullness of his humanity, the fullness of his divinity. Um, and what's important to emphasize here is that the divinity of Christ is not just something revealed by Jesus himself, it is in the Gospels, or taught by apostles like Paul, which he does. Like, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, he's real clear about this. But also in the Apocalypse of John, the book of Revelation is one of the clearest witnesses to the fullness of Jesus' divinity. Because in the Apocalypse of John, the risen Christ talks about his divinity in ways that are very, very explicit. I don't know if you have, like I did when I was a when I was confirmed, I received a, a, what they call a red letter Bible. So it was a Catholic Bible, um, but the words of Christ were printed in red. And so you could always find the Gospels very easily just by seeing the red letters, because that's where Jesus spoke. But one of the things I noticed early on when I was reading um, my Bible was that there were red letters, not just in the Gospel. There was one other place where there were red letters, and that's in the book of Revelation. Because John hears the words, not of the earthly Christ during his public ministry, but of the risen Christ during his heavenly glory. And so Christ here is speaking to John about his own identity. He's not just revealing that he's coming soon. He also reveals the nature of his divinity. His divinity. And this is what he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. To a contemporary Gentile reader, you might not hear the words, I am God, when you, when you read those words. But to an ancient Jewish reader, as well as an ancient Greek speaker, this is actually going to be fairly clear because of what these words imply. So when Jesus says he's the Alpha and he's the Omega, those are a reference to the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Right? So just as the English alphabet begins with A and ends with Z, so too the ancient Greek alphabet began with an alpha and then ended with the letter omega. Right? So it's a kind of powerful way of emphasizing first and last. Like we will say from A to Z as a metaphor for from the beginning to the end, Jesus says here alpha and omega. And then of course he makes that clear by saying I'm also the first and the last, I'm the beginning and the end. Now, with the, that expression, John is alluding to a passage in the Old Testament, surprise, um, that gives it a deeper meaning. So if you go back to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, you can, you'll read these words. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last 
besides me, there is no God. So when Jesus, when the risen Jesus speaks to John and says, I am the first and the last, he's taking the words of God from the book of Isaiah chapter 44 and making them his own words. And if you're a Jew and you know the context, the original context of that declaration, I am the first and the last, you'll realize it's one of the most explicit oracles about what we call monotheism, right? In other words, the God of the Old Testament is saying, I'm the first and the last because I'm the only true God. There is no other God beside me. And yet here we have Jesus of Nazareth, who's also fully human, but has now risen, speaking to John, the author of the Apocalypse, and saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. So what this means, this is beautiful and powerful, is that the risen Christ in the apocalypse is both affirming his divinity and doing so in the context of an allusion to an affirmation of monotheism in the book of Isaiah. So at the same time that he's revealing his divinity, he's also safeguarding the oneness of God. That Jesus is not another God in addition to the God of the Old Testament. Jesus is not another deity in addition to the God of Israel. He is both somehow fully human and fully God, such that we can speak of one God in more than one person. Okay. And if you have any doubts about that, you can actually look at the way this language is used throughout the book of Revelation. So for example, if you look at this chart, um, you'll see the parallels really clear that throughout the book of Revelation, God will speak about his identity and divinity. And then the risen Christ will speak about his identity and divinity using the exact same words. So for example, in Revelation 1.8, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. And then in 1.17, Christ says, I am the first and the last, the living one. And then again, in Revelation 21, 6, God, who is seated on the throne, God the Father, says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and the beginning and the end. And then in Revelation 22, 13, Christ, the risen Christ, says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So which is it? Is God the Father, Alpha and Omega, or is it Christ, right? Is God the Father, the first and the last, or is it Christ? And the answer is, of course, yes, it's both of those are true, because what's being revealed in this final passage from the book of Revelation is nothing less than the mystery of Jesus' divinity. And it's revealing to us that the divinity of Christ is not the divinity of a, another deity in addition to the one God, but rather of the Son, right, who is one with the Father, to use the language of later Trinitarian dogma. Right. So um, this is a very pow it's very powerful and very significant, in other words, that the, the entire Bible and the book of Revelation ends with the revelation of Jesus' divinity. And not just any kind of divinity, but his eternal divinity. He's not a man who is made God, right? He is God from all eternity. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. His divine person has no beginning and has no end. Now, that divine person is going to be united to a human nature in time, right? But the person of Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of the Father. It's the eternal divinity of Jesus that's being revealed here. And that's very important because, as you'll see, when you get to the saints, the writings of the saints, they're going to talk about our becoming partakers of the divine nature, right? That in Christ, we've all become partakers of the divine nature or the divinization or theosis of Christians. You'll see this in the second letter of Peter, but also in the writings of the early church fathers. But it's always important to emphasize that when the fathers and saints talk about our divinization, they mean that we remain human persons, but we begin become partakers of the divine nature. But with Christ, right, he is a divine person from all eternity, who assumes the human nature and then allows that human nature to be put to death, raised up, and glorified.